truth that he brings to us through your word. And Father, we thank you for the open hearts that we have, and we just ask that your heart would be our heart this morning, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, I'm getting my, rec- my backup recorder out here. Why don't we all turn to Leviticus chapter 20. And tonight we're going to be looking at Leviticus 18 through 21. And in Leviticus 18 through 21, it's kind of the moral code of moral cleanliness where Earlier in Leviticus, there was the, the ceremonial cleanliness, the foods, the animals, touching dead things and all that. Now we actually get into moral cleanliness, true moral issues. And as you go through 18, 19, and 20, you see it for all of Israel, and 20 and 21 is for concerning the priests specifically. And so as I was just praying about what to expound upon on a Sunday morning, I was, you know, a lot of it is very, just jumps from one thing to the other. It kind of recaps the Ten Commandments and gives some more depth. And one of the places where the most concise, you know, thought was, is found in chapter 20 in verses 1 through 5. And so let us read those verses, and then let us pray and dive in. Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Again, you shall say to the children of Israel, Whoever of the children of Israel or of the strangers who dwell in in Israel, who gives any of his descendants to Molech, he shall surely be put to death. The people of the land shall stone him with stones. I will set my face against that man, and I'll cut him off from the people, because he's given some of his descendants to Molech, to defile my sanctuary and profane my holy name. And if the people of the land should in any way hide their eyes from the man, when he gives some of his descendants to Molech, and they do not kill him, then I will set my face against that man and against his family, and I will cut him off from his people and all who prostitute themselves with him to commit harlotry with Molech. Let us pray. Father God, your word is always alive. It is always powerful, and it is always sharp and piercing into our hearts and our souls. And Lord God, uh, you guide, Lord, this church, and you guide us through your word, and you always seem to get us where we need to be, when we need to be there. And so I thank you, God, that we find ourselves in Leviticus 20 today, and I pray, God, that we would all continue to take things away from your word as you continue to plant it into our heart. I pray that it takes roots and that it, that it develops and grows within us, God, and that we would be changed by your word and we would be motivated and inspired, and as always, God, that we would continue to be sanctified and made more like Jesus day by day, prayer by prayer, and verse by verse. And so, God, through the power of your Holy Spirit, open our eyes, open our ears, and most of all, God, open our hearts to receive whatever you would speak to us today. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well... So this Molech character, he shows up a bunch throughout the entire Old Testament. We see him here really first, or actually in chapter 18, get mentioned first by name. And then throughout the history of Israel, we see Molech. Now what's interesting about Molech is that uh, it's actually a combination of words. Um, Melech means king in Hebrew. And Bosheth means shame. And what's interesting is they would, in somewhat of a derogatory sense, you might say, um, kind of modify the name of the pagan god to kind of give it a negative connotation. And so by combining king with shame, you get molech, but you'll notice it's spelled differently. And it's actually totally different in lots of different places throughout the Old Testament. Um, Again, melech is king in Hebrew. Uh, You might be familiar with the terms like abimelech, or even Melchizedek, all those names have the word king as part of the person's name. And so by combining these phrases, you end up with Molech, but he's also pronounced as Moloch, or Mikoli, or Malcolm. Malcolm would be like their king. So it's always speaking of the same Ammonite king that was being worshipped. What's interesting is that 
it, the whole world changes when you have a biblical worldview and you come with the Bible being the most authoritative truth on history, the most authoritative truth on a science. When you start there, everything truly does make more sense. And what you find in world history is, you know, people, and the thing is, is that secular science, they might date things differently than the Bible dates them, but they agree, you know, well, you can take things all back to one religion, and, and this was, it was this worship and that, you can get all the way back um, to the mother goddess, and you can get back to Babylon, and when you see religions start breaking out, and what's funny is that if you follow, like, Greek mythology, so many of their stories, you can actually follow a trail of breadcrumbs that leads you back to biblical stories. When you see things like the story of Noah and the Nephilim, you can follow a trail of breadcrumbs that takes you to the Titans in Greek mythology. And so it's fascinating that the Nephilim, the Bible says, are held captive. The, the, the evil spirits were put into Tartarus. Well, that's the same Greek place that the Titans are kept. And so it's interesting to see these things unfold. So actually this Molech or Moloch character later on is actually like Saturn as worshipped by the Romans. And so you see it spread into Egypt. You actually see it spread through the Greeks. This same God, pagan God or false God, that is being worshipped. And so all those references are up there. Just so you know, as you go through your Bible and you're reading your Old Testament, you'll realize this is the same person. They just have different names for the same guy. But you'll find the characteristics, this concept of burning the children or passing them through the fire you'll see that attached to all the different names. And so that's how we know, okay, they're talking about the same pagan deity is just uh, a different names for the same person. And so this is God just warning. I mean, we read it, and it's pretty straightforward. God is saying, I'm against this. Uh, you shall not do what the Canaanites are doing around you. They're coming into this land, and this is what the people are doing, and they're passing their children through the fire, and I'll mention it now, and maybe I'll just bring it up as a good reminder that God is not only against this practice, he's condemning anyone who doesn't speak out, actually. He's saying, like, no, 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 if the people of the land should in any way hide their eyes from the man when he gives some of his descendants to Molech, and they do not kill him, then I'll set my face against that man and against his family. God was so serious about this, He's saying, like, you, you can't just be silent when this stuff is going on. Now, this idea of passing the children through the fire, this is a, a picture of, of Molech worship, one of many. And again, what we have are archaeological remains. What's difficult, and actually my trips to Israel have really educated me a lot about that, specifically talking to Jewish guides, because they're not Christians, they're Jews. One thing you will find is that the Jews, very, the, anything that paints them in a negative light, and this is, I mean, we all are this way, right? They, they try and downplay it or find a way around it. I know one way you can get your Jewish guide, and uh, if you do go to Israel and you've never been there, you'll find, I know people are usually surprised they're not Christian guides. They're talking about Jesus, taking you all these sites. They're like, no, no, that's, that's an Orthodox Jew. He's telling you all this because that's his job, and he's good at his job. But he's not, or he's a secular Jew, most of them are. But all that said, like you get to Gadara, where the uh, Swine Lake took place, right? Where all the pigs jump off into the water. Well, the idea is, is they'll try and call it by another name or they'll try and find a way around it because they don't want it to be the tribe of Gad because that would mean the tribe of Gad were raising pigs and that doesn't look good. So they'll excuse, no, 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 it's not the Gadarenes, it's the Gerasenes and that's different. No, 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 that was the same thing. But another one is they don't like to admit in the times of Solomon, that Solomon started to worship to Ashtoreth, the goddess of fertility, and also to Molech. And he put up the high places and whatnot in the valley of Hinnom. And we'll actually, we'll flip over and take a look at that. It'll be in Jeremiah 7, so we can flip over there in a second, uh, or you can get a head start. But the idea was, was it was that they would have these altars on which they would place their children. The altars would be burning hot, typically hollow, so a fire would burn out from the inside, and it would essentially incinerate anything that was laid upon it. So Jeremiah 7, it just paints a good picture for us 
again of what's going on in this time and in this place. And there are many scriptures I could have flipped through, but starting in verse 28, and I'm expanding a little bit for our context, it says, So you shall say to them, This is a nation that does not obey the voice of the Lord, their God, nor receive correction. Truth has perished and is cut off from their mouth. So he's talking about the nation and the state of the nation. Cut off your hair and cast it away and take a lamentation on the desolate heights for the Lord has rejected and forsaken the generation of his wrath. For the children of Judah have done evil in my sight, says the Lord. They have set their abominations in the house which is called by my name to pollute it. And they have built the high places of Tophet which is in the valley of the son of Hinnom to burn their sons and their daughters in the fire, which I did not command, nor did, I, did it come into my heart. Therefore, behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when it will no longer be called Tophet or the valley of the son of Hinnom, but the valley of slaughter. For they will bury in Tophet until there is no room. The corpses of this people will be food for the birds and of heaven and the beasts of the earth, and no one will frighten them away. Then I will cause to cease from the cities of Judah and from the streets of Jerusalem the voice of mirth and the voice of gladness, the voice of the bridegroom and the voice of the bride, for the land shall be desolate. So it talks about, it's in this Hinnom Valley where they set up a high place. And this is just interesting to learn that I know for a fact, this is also true, that they would worship on the mountaintops to the pagan gods, but also high places refer to these large structures. Again, this is just one picture, but they would build these very, very large structures for their worship. And so you'll notice it says here, it built the high place in verse 31. They have built the high places. It wasn't they built on a high place. They were building this large structure. Here's another picture of what we see for the Molech worship. It was always a man with this bull's head and he has his outstretched arms. Now this one, it looks a little bit different. So this will give you some perspective on the size of this uh, altar. I'm going to read to you from Rabbi Kimchi. Now Rabbi Kimchi lived around 1000 AD, so about 1000 years ago. And so he was describing this type of worship and this will actually help us understand the Hinnom Valley and all of it. He says, set within seven chapels, and you can see the holes in the chest. Set within seven chapels, and whoso offered fine flour, they opened him one. Turtle doves or young pigeons, they opened a second. A lamb, a third. A ram, a fourth. A calf, they opened the fifth. For an ox, they opened a sixth. And whoever offered his son, they opened him seven. And so it was this progressive, you know, how many of those little containers would you offer up to the most worthy sacrifice of a son. And his face was that of a calf, and his hands stretched like forth like a man who opens his hands to receive something from his neighbor. And they kindled, uh, they kindled it with fire, and the priest took the babe and put it into the hands of Molech. And the babe gave up the ghost. And why is it called Tophet and Hinnom? Because they used to make noise with drums, which are tophim, that the father might not hear the cry of his child and have pity upon him and return to him. Hin him because the babe wailed and the noise of his wailing went up. So that's what we talked about, tophet. The root word is tafa or tafim, and that's where we get drums from. So it's interesting now as you read your Old Testament, you read this tophet in the Hinnom Valley. In the Greek, the Hinnom Valley, ge is for the valley, and it's called Gehenna or Gehinnom. And so when Jesus makes reference to Gehenna, that is hell is how it's translated into our New Testament. So most often, if Jesus Christ is speaking words in red in your New Testament, and he says Gehenna, we would read hell. But that's what he's describing is this valley. And it became a trash heap and a place where they dumped their trash and all that and whatnot. But So what he's describing is this practice of worship where, so maybe to paint a picture, because maybe you're very familiar, you've read these stories before, but I always wonder, how do you get so degraded, and how do you get to this place? How do the people get so low? But you'll note, right, that the drums were played so that a father would not have pity on his child whom he sacrificed. The true idea was, was they were trying to drown out, right, everything else, <laughs> drown out the screams, drown out the reality of what's taking place, 
so that they could have this worship. And not all children were sacrificed in this way. What the idea was, was one of the early or firstborn children would be sacrificed with the promise of fertility in the future, health for your future children, that you would have prosperity in the land. So it wasn't just they just did this, you know, just kind of flagrantly just kind of doing it. They did it with an intent that by sacrificing this child, I would have favor with the gods from that point forward. And it, it dealt with their issue of having so many unexpected children because when you go to the worship of Ashtoreth, who is like the Greek equivalent of Aphrodite, right? They were having all these orgies. They were having all of this stuff in worship to their God and to the temple priestesses. And this was the outcome was all these children. And so this is the byproduct. And now, I know you guys came to church on a great Sunday morning thinking it'd be all the fun and positive, but the reality is, is this is the world that has existed for thousands of years and nothing has changed that the world we live in is still very similar to this because now if I, if I take that illustration of why did they worship to Molech, what was the promises, what was the things they were doing to make it happen, and we can take that to 2019 and you find a very similar thing. And as we saw the unplanned trailer earlier, you find in that movie, and I've heard this saying before, babies are being sacrificed upon the altar of convenience. You see, if someone conceives a child, then it is an inconvenient circumstance. It is an unwanted circumstance, which truly could be horrifically induced, right? I mean, it could be from rape. It could be from all these different things. But I can't have a baby right now because I've got a future ahead of me, and I've got planning I have to do, and I have these things. And so the same idea is, is that the sacrifice of that child is so that the future children will have, will have a better life. I'm not ready for kids now, but later. And you'll be ready for it. And if someone has any kind of conviction at all, the people who promote abortion are really good at banging drums <laughs> and making a lot of noise and doing a lot of things to drown out the voice of reason. And as you see Abby in the movie, right, based on a true story, and you can go on YouTube and watch her interviews, and they're good, and she'll talk about how she was trained in the art of persuasion, and that they had memorized scripts and dialogues. If you've ever debated a Mormon on your doorstep, doorstep, they're very prepared if they're on their game. You know, if you keep them in the realm of what they normally talk about, here's an 18-year-old boy who... They can hit you back, 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 because they've memorized scripts. And these are the common complaints. Here's how you respond. Abby shares how at Planned Parenthood, she was trained with a similar thing. That, when, well, when they have a religious conviction, they had all these responses to people with religious backgrounds and religious conviction. This is how you do it, you know? And isn't God a forgiving God? And would God really want this child to grow up in an you know, impoverished home? And so it's, it's a crazy, wicked thing. Now, I was going to jump there later, but let's just all really quickly turn in our Bibles to 1 John. Let's just do this before we even continue. I feel like we need this first. Normally, I would put a single verse uh, up on the screen for us just to read together, but this is where we need to flip together because it is important that we have our Bibles out, that they are open in front of us, and that in the pews or chairs around you there are highlighters and there are pens. And so in First John chapter 1, I'm in a New King James, and I don't usually ever do this with you guys, but can you guys read with me verse 9? If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. I, I put that here and now because while much of what we're talking about today can be such a downer, it's a reminder for all of us that if we confess our sins, that he is faithful, meaning he won't fail. And he's just, meaning he is God and he has the right 
to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And I say that because statistically speaking, one or more people here have taken part in abortion. That's just the way statistics work. And it's painful and it's hard. And it's something you look back on and regret. But God is faithful and just to forgive us. And so none of us should ever walk in condemnation for decisions we've made in the past. And maybe it's not abortion. You know, who knows what sins you have committed that you are ashamed of and you carry with you and it hurts. But the idea is, is God forgives. He does forgive all of us who are confessing and seeking his face and repenting. And I don't want anything to do with that old life that I once lived. And so I wanted to make sure I got that out there so that you would never feel condemned because God wants to free us. But our sins do condemn us if we don't take God's gift of grace that he bought and paid for us on the cross. And there is not one sin that is more powerful than his death on the cross. Nothing you can do can outdo what he did. Now, this is where things get kind of fun and interesting. Taking things again back to 2019, 2018, 19, I think it was January of 19. So I told Roberta I'd have a couple shockers for people today. Um, most of us are familiar with at the Freedom Tower, the tower built where the two towers, the trade centers, once stood that were destroyed on 9-11, that in New York they, they passed the bill allowing the abortions to go on up until childbirth uh, for medical reasons for the mother or if the child is not viable. And you can go on YouTube and you can find, as they're signing the legislator, the whole room roaring with applause at this uh, victory for women's rights to kill children. And they light up the Freedom Tower with a pink light. Now, I saw a picture that was actually quite moving that also shows that there's the picture of the top of the Freedom Tower. But if you were able to pan down and zoom into the bottom of the Freedom Tower, there are the names of everyone who died on 9-11 and the names of nine unborn children. Or the, it was not named yet, but they are memorialized on the plaque below. This is memorialized on the, on the tower above. But now here's what I did with some research, and I, I, I'm very thankful for Andrea Donaldson from Life Options working with me and talking with me a little bit. Um, you see, globally, let's see my, my numbers I've out here, 41 million abortions in 2018, globally. And that meant that 23% of all births ended in, a, in an abortion globally. So one in four. That was globally. Now, in America, America is the 10th uh, highest amount of abortions uh, in the world. And what's interesting is if you look at the ones that beat it, some are scattered, but a lot are actually in uh, Russia, Soviet Georgia, or what was Soviet you know, Georgia, and in that kind of area, the old Soviet era. And I actually remember my Russian professor taught me about this. I took Russian in college, and uh, she actually explained that uh, abortion was so high in Russia in the Soviet Union because birth control was outlawed. By outlawing birth control, abortion became the solution. And so that is actually why it's still so prevalent there today. But in America, the Americans Unified for Life every year rates all 50 states on how favorable and protective they are of life. Arizona is number one right now is the most baby-friendly state to live in. I know it's a lot of small letters up there, so I can zoom in for you guys if you need a little bit better view. So Washington State falls at 50th place where it has sat on their list for the last 10 years. That we have held the most unsafe place for a baby to be <laughs> conceived in the nation. Here's a history if you didn't know. Roe versus Wade was 1973, I believe, where the earlier abortions, the first-term abortions, were legalized nationwide. November 3, 1970, Washington State, three years earlier, becomes the 15th state to legalize it before Roe versus Wade. It was the first state to ever pass it by a majority vote of the people. All the other states, the people did not vote. It was Washington State where the people voted, and they said, 
what they wanted. 1991, Initiative 120 passes. That was Referendum 20. Now we have Initiative 120 in 1991. Here's the key part behind it. Every individual possesses a fundamental right of privacy with respect to personal reproductive decisions. The initiative passed by 4,222 votes out of 1,509,402. Again, that's 4,200 out of 1.5 million. 4,200 people is less than half the population of Grandview. I did some other quick research. In 1991, the population of Washington was 5 million. Only 1.5 million people voted 25% of Washington self-declare themselves as an evangelical Christian. That's 1.25 million people. Again, it was 51% won the vote out of the 1.5 million. So that means it's only 750,000 people voted for this. Yet 1.25 Washingtonians call themselves evangelical. 61% of Washingtonians call themselves a Christian whether that falls under Catholic, Protestant, you know, mainline or evangelic or whatnot, that's the status in Washington state. And so what you might not realize is that while New York just passed that law, they have now moved themselves up to where Washington has actually been ever since the 70s. That in Washington state, there is nothing protecting an unborn child up until childbirth if they declare it for the health of the mother or that the child's life is not viable if the child passes. Uh, some of you may remember prayer requests circling around that one of my closest and best friends, Aaron Bloom from Ellensburg, and his wife, Melissa, their child was di- diagnosed with a very rare disease where just horrific type of outcome, and most people do opt to abort. Melissa carried young cadence. Carried her as long as she could. And um, she was able to give a natural childbirth, which was a big deal because she'd already had C-sections with her earlier children. And so God had a lot of mercy there because that opens the door for future children because they try and cut you off on on the C-sections and whatnot. But that is one reason why they would allow an abortion. And the other one is if it's the health of the mother. And Andrea clarified, and you can read online, mental health is health of the mother. So if the mom mentally can't handle a child that could open the door for a late-term abortion (sighs) good news the good news so 2016 this is the newest stats andrea got for me for every hundred live children born in washington 19 were aborted but in 2006 10 years older that was 28 out of 100 so it went from 28 out of 100 to 19 out of 100 yakima county went down from 06 to 16, from 18 out of 100 to 13 out of 100. Um, I do think Yakima County is lower, possibly, and this is just my guess, uh, due to the higher Hispanic population and the influence of the Catholic Church and the fact that many people are raised up with that idea that that's not going to happen. And so there is a stronger influence of religion in the valley, more than people maybe would give credit to, where at least... Abortion's not happening as much as it could be happening. Now, we were in Leviticus 20, and I'm, I flipped back there. I snuck back. If you can turn, look back to Leviticus 18. We'll be covering this tonight, um, but I just wanted to read it through, just a handful of verses, because I, I am going to get to something bright at the end of this. Don't worry. There is an answer, actually, and a cure. And so... We could start anywhere, but if we start with the Molech worship in verse, it's only one verse in chapter 18, it gets recapped in 20. Leviticus 18, verse 21, it says, You shall not let any of your descendants pass through the fire to Molech, nor shall you profane the name of your God. I am Yahweh, right? I am the Lord. You shall not lie with a male as with a woman. It is an abomination, You shall not mate with any animal to defile yourself with it, nor shall any woman stand before an animal to mate with it. It is perversion. Do not defile yourselves with any of these things 
For by all these nations are defiled, which I am casting out before you. For the land is defiled, therefore I visit the punishment of its iniquity upon it, and the land vomits out its inhabitants. So he's recapping, really verse like 19 down to 23 is kind of like specific things that the Canaanites were doing that God calls, calls vile, and I'm now vomiting them out of the land for you. You might remember Genesis 15, 16, where God promises the land to Abraham, but tells him, you're going to keep sojourning because the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet complete. And Molech was the Ammonite god. The idea was, was even though they were wicked when Abraham was there, the days of Sodom and Gomorrah, God has so much grace that it's not a time clock that's ticking, it's a morality clock. And God is watching the morality just get worse and worse and worse but he says, I'm not kicking them out of the land until it just hits rock bottom, at which point I'm going to vomit them out. I'm going to kick them out. You're going to go in there, and you're going to wipe them out. Now, notice in verse 26, he does say, You shall therefore keep my statutes and my judgments and shall not commit any of these abominations, either any of your own nation or any stranger who dwells with you, for all these abominations the men of the land have done who were before you, and thus the land is defiled. Lest the land vomit you out also. And for those of us who know our Old Testament... That is exactly what will happen, that the Israelites will then start to bring in the Molech worship, the Ammonite worship, into their society. Israel, the top ten tribes, they go first. Later, Judah goes. Israel taken out by the Assyrians, Judah by the Babylonians. And what is amazing is that when God finally casts them out of the land, when they come back from Babylon, you never see any pagan worship in the Jewish people. In fact, you see the creation of the Pharisees, some people who keep themselves so far from false worship, it turned into something else that wasn't good. But God casts them out. He kicks them out. He spews them. He vomits them out of the land. That was what he was doing to the Canaanites who practiced such things. And I'm reading it one more time again from chapter 20 in... Verse 4, and if the people of the land should in any way hide their eyes from the man when he gives some of his descendants to Molech and they do not kill him, and I don't think we should kill people, but then I will set my face against that man, against his family, and I will cut him off from his people and all who prostitute themselves with him to commit harlotry with Molech. And the person who turns to mediums, familiar spirits, he goes on, he's just saying any of those things that they did, I'm going to set my face against you if you don't speak out. Now, the answer, the cure. It's, it's been good. It's been fun. I, I love watching the Lord work, and it's, it's fun, I think, a pastor's life in this sense that I, I watch God, you know, weaving and working and spinning a web, and every now and then I'll just watch that web interconnect in all these different places all at one time, and it's just fun to because I get to be kind of in everybody's mix. People come and talk or whatever it may be. And so I get to see what's going on all over. And then you get to see the same, you know, I giving the same exact response to everyone. It's like, huh, this is the advice you need. This is the biblical answer you need. And, and what I have found as of late is that whether it's how do we fix this, how do we solve that, while I will promote and encourage all of you guys, when the opportunity comes to vote, go and vote one year ago, an initiative failed in our legislature to protect unborn children. It didn't get to a vote of the people from what I understand, but it can make its comeback. Be promoting these things. 1991, 4,000 people. Now, here's the thing. I don't think the answer is lots more political rallying, lots more, because if you go online, you read the news, that's all there is, is just two polar opposites sitting there blasting each other. And so we need to do like the Trojan horse approach. We need the back door. And what I've found personally is the way to stop abortion isn't laws because we've seen that with everything, right? When they had abortion laws, people were getting back door, you know, alley and basement abortions. 
when they tried a prohibition, that worked great, right? To create organized crime. Like, I mean, that's the thing is it, it didn't help. What has to change is the hearts of the people. If we change people's hearts, if people come to know Jesus Christ, abortion becomes no longer an issue for that person. It becomes a moot point. And so rather than, and again, I support life options, or I'm going to be doing the walk for life. I'm going to be even more of an advocate now as I continue to grow in my own knowledge of how Washington State, last place on the list, putting you in actually the most optimal mission field to try and minister and explain to people the truth about life and conception. But ministering the gospel becomes a higher priority. That I don't want people to stop aborting. I want people to stop going to hell. I want to get people out of that. And so let's read one more place, and we're all going to flip there because you need to double check and make sure you have it highlighted into 2 Chronicles. I went to Psalms. I went too far. If you hit Psalms, you've gone too far. You've got to back up. Now, Second Chronicles 7.14, it's really a, a recipe for revival. And the advice I've been giving people lately is simply this, is that do you want to see the atmosphere of your church change? Do you want to see the atmosphere of your own personal household change? Do you want to see the atmosphere of your workplace or those who you interact with change? The only safe bet, there's lots of ways it could work, but the safest bet and the most surest bet is when we are the saltiest salt and the brightest light, when we are experiencing and demonstrating personal revival in our lives, it is infectious. People see it and they want it. People who are without hope see people who have hope and they desire it. People with fear and anxiety see people free of fear and anxiety or even see people who have fears and anxieties and know how to biblically deal with them. We don't have to fake that we're something we're not, but we do need to start doing the things that we claim are true. I'm going to say that one again. I liked it, right? We don't need to try and fake be something we're not, like, I have no fears at all, like, hand crossed. But we need to start, like, standing on the promises of God and dealing with our fear in a biblical way. When it comes, we repent of it. We say, Lord, help me with my fears. I'm handing it to you. Pray for the stillness of heart and seek all these things. And so 2 Chronicles 7 is the the things are kicking. Things are moving in Israel. The the temple is getting dedicated. It was just built. And now Solomon is uh, is seeing a vision of God. God appears to Solomon now for the second time. And he says in verse 14, If my people who are called by my name would humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, I will hear from heaven, I will forgive their sin and heal their land. And that is what we need. We do not simply need an end to abortion. We need a healing of our land. And the recipe to that is not laws and it's not politics and it's not memes and it's not you know, sharing posts, and it's not, you know, inspirational speeches. We just break this down simply. My people who are called by my name. Now, this is a promise to Israel, but being a Christian, I am a little Christ. And it says, if they humble themselves, it is something we often struggle with to actually continually be in a state of saying, I need God's help. I don't have this figured out. I am not perfect. I'm just continually in a state of remembering how desperately I need God. Continually reminded that I am a sinner and he's a great savior. And there's some kind of a fun correlation because the lower of a sinner we start to realize we are, the higher and more mighty of a savior we understand that we have. That, man, I am messed up, but he is so much stronger than that. Next part, we pray. The disciples tell Jesus, teach us to pray. 
And it could just be semantics, right? But it is not how to pray. The, the word for word is teach us to pray. And I think more often than not, as believers, we don't need to be taught how to pray. We just need to be taught to pray. <laughs> Get us to do it, Lord. Get me to pray. And seek my face. And I think about the idea of just seeking God, taking time out to seek him. If we do not set aside a time to seek God, we're not going to do it. This is where things like devotions and why you'll continually hear me bring up the significance and dedicate whole messages to having a strong devotional life. Because you cannot pour out if you're not being poured into. You cannot fill others if you yourself are not full. And so unless I seek the Lord, humbling myself, praying, and seeking his face, I've got nothing to offer anyone. And lastly, it says, turn from their wicked ways. And I remember a really good message I listened to by a pastor named John McClure, and it was right after 9-11, um, and he preached on this. And later I heard him speak again, and he talked about how 9-11 was amazing and interesting to watch in Congress, in our government, because people did humble themselves after the attack of 9-11. We saw many people pray, and we saw many people seek God's face, but what America never did was turn from their wicked ways. We had like three out of four going for us. But just like any relationship, my favorite picture is that of adultery, because it is. It doesn't matter what I do for my bride, if I am cheating on her, no amount of, my wife's a communication, that's her love language, right? So no matter how much I communicate with her, if I'm cheating on with her, it's all for nothing. It doesn't matter if I buy her gifts, if I'm cheating on her, it's all for nothing. And God has always viewed open acts of rebellious sin, open acts of rebellious sin, not our stumbling and our tripping when he knows where our heart is at, but when we live in sin, it's, it's harlotry, as he calls it all through the Old Testament. It's us cheating on him. But if we pray, seek his face, turn from our wicked ways, it says he'll hear from heaven, I'll forgive them their sin, and heal their land. We have this verse hanging in our stairwell. For a reason. It's, it's a recipe for personal revival. Truly personal revival is synonymous with the baptism of the Holy Spirit. It's this experience this time and this thing where God is pouring into you and he's working through you and everything is just amazing when the Holy Spirit is upon us and working through us. But it takes these things. And if you haven't memorized verse 15, because most of us, I think, 2 Chronicles seven fourteen is a common one that we hear quoted, but I like verse 15 as well. Now my eyes will be open and my ears attentive to prayer made in this place. Wouldn't that be awesome? If the Lord God Almighty, Yahweh, would say that about our church, that if the people here who are called by his name would humble themselves, pray and seek his face and turn from their wicked ways, that God would hear from heaven, right? Forgive sin, heal the land, but then when prayer is made in this place, he says, my eyes will be open and my ears will be attentive. When these people are praying, I'll be pay paying a close attention to them because I know that they're sold out for me. I know that they're giving their all for me. I'm going to go on a limb here and just say this. It does require all four, and turning from our wicked ways is one of those four things. So I want to encourage everyone here today, do ask God. Search me and know my heart, right? See if there's any wicked way within me, because I don't think God is going to bless a person, a household, a family, or a church if it's full of secret sin. It's easy for us to see what's on the outside, your peers and whatnot, but we can't see what goes on at home, what goes on when you're alone, the thoughts you hold in your brain. But if we hand those things over to God, he'll heal us, he'll forgive us our sins. I want to read this one last quote to close. And it was uh, from uh, my... Uh, Oh, my brain just went blank. Herald of His Coming, that newspaper article we give out back there on the table. If you haven't got one, you should grab it because they're amazing. But uh, from a former uh, edition, a guy by the name of Al Whittinghill, he wrote an article titled, Revival Can Save a Nation. And this is his closing paragraph. 
He says, the world is waiting to see the New Testament church clothed with power from on high and brimming over with the joy of the resurrection life. Revival in the church. It is the only hope for our nation and the world. Isn't it true? The church cannot have a message for the heart of the world until the Lord has the heart of the church. The church must be ignited by the Lord or we will be ignored by the world. God loves a church aflame. He cannot abide in lukewarm. It is time to seek the Lord and let the Holy Spirit burn the promises of 2 Chronicles 7.14 into our very being. Lord, send revival and let it begin in me. Let's pray that. Lord God, I thank you uh, for your word and just uh, the, the opening of my own eyes, God, to the wickedness in my own land. And God, I pray that you would just